Hello, everyone. Thanks again for attending tonight and this webinar. Well, everybody, are we ready to grow? It is growth, growth, growth. It is exciting times, you guys, for both of these careers in health administration and public health. We are seeing amazing statistics. When we look at healthcare administration, the outlook is a 22% projected growth rate over the next, this 10 year period from 2010 to 2020. That is incredible, you guys. When you look at the average growth rate for other occupations being about five to 10%, good, still stable in a thriving economy, but in this area, when we're looking at 22% to 25% growth patterns, it's absolutely incredible. And that's what we, right? When we get degrees, when we get certifications, we wanna look at, okay, where are the jobs? Are they really here? And we have the statistics to prove that, which are exciting. And public health, the employment outlook is, is right there with health administration at 21% projected growth rate over the next 10 years. And what's even more exciting about this, when we've looked at the statistics over just the last five years, we see a 29 to 30% growth rate in, this, in the jobs being secured in public health and health administration. So just as Dr. Rubino had talked about, the growth and our political growth as we have health care reform, which public health is tied right with that, we see tremendous growth and opportunity in these areas, which is fantastic. So across the board with the healthcare industry, which incorporates public health, we have a lot of public health educators working now at hospitals, and obviously one of the pillars of public health is health administration, so both of these programs are very integrated. But when we look at the healthcare industry, it will generate 5.6 million new jobs by 2020. Sounds good, right? There's gonna be places to apply. That is key, right? That is the key. So the demand for healthcare and public health both is soaring in the U.S. Uh, as we talked about, double the rate of the national economy over the next year, eight years, which is exciting because as we look at the economic growth and it's now strengthened, we're out of the recession um, in terms of in the U.S. So we have a stronger economy and we have more of a focus on prevention and both health care for the needs of the sick, but also on the prevention side. You know, as we see with Michelle Obama's Let's Move campaign, we are focused on prevention and wellness in this country across the board. It isn't about, you know, treating the sick entirely, but it's also about prevention programs and keeping people healthy, keeping people living longer, and we need jobs in response to that and in both industries. So pretty exciting, and these aren't, you know, we always like, statistics, where did they come from? This is the U.S. Bureau of Labor of Statistics in 2013, and we've been following this with, with various data, and it's, it's very exciting. And we find that, too, in public health, there's a 70%, 80% recognition of what public health and those in health administration do. You know, it used to be 10, 15 years ago when I, back in the day, in the old day, when I got my degree in public health from here at CSUN in the 90s, we'd say, health education, public health, what do you do? You sit in a classroom, I don't even know what you do. Or public, you only can work at a health department. That's the only place you can work at. And in fact, that's, that's not the reality. There's now 80% of employers in the public health and health administration fields recognize what a public health educator does, what a health administrator does, and knows exactly the need for that. So it's pretty exciting times. So what can I do with my master's in public health, the MPH? Well, a lot of us can think back to times when you had that aha moment about your sort of career goals and what you wanted to do in the future. And a lot of times when you reflect back, it's probably when you were pretty young. You know, for me, I lost um, my favorite aunt who was very near and dear to me to breast cancer when I was 12. And even before then, I had wanted, I had always been intrigued by medicine from a very young age. And so I, I had that interest, and I actually applied to medical school in the Caribbean. That's a whole other story that I'll have to tell you someday. But you can think back to that moment where you were touched by either a family member's health issue, your own health issue, others, or it, it may have been you started out thinking, yeah, I'd like to be a doctor or a nurse. But then, you know, we call it sometimes, you know, we kind of laugh because in public health, nobody says when they're six years old or, or you know, eight years old, I want to grow up to be a public health educator and public health, you know, not like a firefighter or an astronaut or something, right? You kind of discover it. But then when you do and you, and you realize it's so focused on prevention 
and touching people's lives, keeping the focus on, as I said before, people living longer, living healthier, and um, practicing lifestyle habits that um, will hopefully keep them healthy and alive and disease-free forever, it becomes very exciting, right? And you can think back to that time, well, yeah, I remember when I be first became intrigued in either allied health or medicine. And so what, but what can you do with this degree? What do you actually do with it? And when we look at it versus an undergrad degree in public health, health education, that places you in a more coordinator role or more support role. But a master's in public health, get ready, because if you like to direct, direct personnel, direct budgets, programs, grants and things, you're in the right area. So we will teach you with this program how to create, direct, and advocate for approaches, again, as I talked about before, that are focused on prevention, which is exciting. Many of our graduates go on to work in state public health departments, um, local health departments, national, the Centers for Disease Control. We've had interns go to the World Health Organization, and we'll talk more about that later. But again, focused on prevention and wellness. Conducting needs assessments. Well, that kind of sounds a little dry, right? You're like, what? Anything involving a survey? But no, it's very exciting. There's so many uh, innovative needs assessment techniques, like u utilizing photo voice, taking pictures, taking audio records of, of people's experiences, and really getting into the qualitative and quantitative of what people experience in terms of their health and disease outcomes. Implementing and evaluating health-based programs, you will learn how to implement programs for positive behavior change. And they might be knowledge programs, they might be behavior programs, they might be refocusing somebody's attitude towards a more positive outlook on wellness. And it might be, you know, looking at worksite wellness programs, you might be at a corporation where you're focused on prevention, or it might be they're actually out in the community in a grant-funded program. We have faith-based organizations now involved, community-based organizations. So you're implementing and evaluating, learning those skills on how to really evaluate those programs for how for their quality that, that, that they are. And then creating relevant communication materials. And this gets fun, guys, I'm telling you. Creating health education materials, and now it involves so much of social media, which you guys could teach me a thing or two. But looking at Facebook and Twitter, we're finding so many innovative ways to reach out to people, texting, in terms of delivering health education content. But you'll learn ways on how to create communication materials that are specific, that really reach people that speak to people, whether it's a brochure in a doctor's office or if it's something, it's a, an actual website, you'd be learning how to create health-based communication materials, which is so important for what we do. And how to lead and execute programs, personnel, and budgets. There's the teams I talked about. And how do you really manage budgets effectively? How do you really manage personnel effectively? You'll be doing that in terms of funded grants out in the real world and working in public health departments, working as a part of either if it's very programs-based or personnel-based. You need to have these skills that are essential as because, as I said before, we're prepping you to be at that sort of director level when you go in. And applied epidemiological principles. We love that word, right? It's like the $500 word, epidemiology. How many syllables does it have? Okay, it's great. But that is the study of disease, mortality, morbidity. And those are fancy words of looking at disease trends or, you know, actually causes of death trends. But why are they impacting certain areas and communities more than others? It's fascinating. And you can do detective works. When we look at Food outbreaks, for example, you know, uh, food poisoning outbreaks in a certain location, we start to look at some of these numbers and epidemiological analysis for both, for both chronic and infectious diseases. It's pretty exciting. And applying the theory, again, as Dr. Rubino had talked about, what are, you know, theory gives you the foundation. We don't become too theoretical in this program because we will have it very practitioner based. We want you to hit the ground running. And a lot of you already are in the ground running. You may be working in public health departments or had a very dynamic internship where you've already been working out in the field in public health. So we want to make that and look at sort of the advanced contemporary model evidence-based programs. What's out there already and what's working? What does the NIH use, National Institutes of Health? What does the CDC use? And what does the American Heart Association use? And how can we incorporate that for our own program and make it successful? Okay. 
we are celebrating over 40 years of public health accreditation, which is exciting, you guys. We've been accredited since 1971. Whenever you're in a program of public health, if it's not accredited through CEATH, the Council on Education for Public Health, this is not a program you want to choose. CEATH upholds the highest standards in public health and ensures our programs, our, our learner outcomes are in alignment, all of our course materials, our syllabi, every experience that you receive and as part of the classroom or the course is certified and is, is worthy and speaks to competencies for public health professionals. So it's key. Our program, as um, Jennifer had says, has been around for 50 years. So it's exciting time. So we wouldn't have gotten this far this many decades without having a solid, reputable program, which you'll be a part of. It's just exciting. Job titles in public health and I, I included also, show me the money, right? That's it, right? Little Jerry Maguire, old school reference there. But it gets exciting, too, as Dr. Urbino mentioned. These are the different areas you can work in in public health, and it really the list is even so much more vast um, than this. But this is actually provided by our Association for Schools of Public Health and the general categories. When you look to the left in terms of salary, that's usually um, actually undergraduate degrees, and so entry level, what we call it. And when you look to the salaries to the right, beyond even just you know the graduate degree, the MPH degree, but usually that involves a little bit of a, um, some years of experience in these various fields. So you see Health Services Administration. This is tied in to um, Dr. Rubino's program and um, the MPA when you think about administering programs. Biostatistics, you know, if you crunch the numbers, you're there in the different areas. Epidemiology, and then you, when you look at health education, behavioral science type of employment, if you're working maybe at a health-based nonprofit, you know, and you're focused on health education, you might, you know, still have a team, and that's 33,000 to 86,000, you kind of get a snapshot of different areas. Environmental health, you know, that is not our area, but it's still a competency that you're going to learn as part of our program. You'll take an environmental health course, which is really fascinating as well, area of public health. International health, you can kind of see the differences there. Maybe you have a desire to travel or work in another country. You've always been passionate about global health or making change in your home country, this gives you the opportunity to do that in that area. And where we see nutrition, you know, working at nutrition-based or it might be a community-based program that their mission is to serve nutrition, education, and awareness programs. And then you can see like public health practice or program management. That's where you're administering different programs as we had spoke of and the salary range there. And what I love, though, too, when you look at the salary ranges on the right, you think, okay, these are tend to be those with a graduate degree and some years of experience. But don't feel, don't feel too deflated because it's not that, oh, this is outside the norm of 30 years because this is an average. And when you think of Los Angeles, right, we have a higher cost of living here and the good news is higher salaries. So we're actually more towards, don't look the complete to the left, we're over towards that mid-range, even in entry level. Um, many of our graduate students from the MPH, when they graduate, I know of a few that right off the bat, they were making sixty-five to $70,000 right here in the local Los Angeles area. So the notion that, hey, public health doesn't pay, there's no money in public health, and hey, no way, we're right up there, okay, with other programs, which is really exciting. The places you may work with a degree in public health, this is just a snapshot, and I had mentioned some of these agencies, again, both state and um, national agencies, you know, very prestigious. You may be passionate about a certain cause. I worked for a breast cancer organization for 10 years before I came to academia. So, and I also worked for a health insurance company for five years before I came to academia. So you just never know um, where your future may hold, but that's what's exciting. Some people like to work at public health departments because they're not focused maybe on one health issue. After 10 years of breast cancer, even though I was very passionate about it, I was like, okay, it's time to move on to a different disease or health issue. <laughs> so you get a little bit of that. Um, and we have extraordinary internship partners, too, in our program for those local, but also for those who are out there nationally. We have many partners out in the community and will help you with that in terms of part of the field of practical experience. So exciting organizations to be a part of and to make that change. Thank you.